Welcome to IIS 2019 and the first episode of Reservoir Talks. I'm here to speak with Dr. Volkoff, who is an expert in, in, in drug abuse and, and, and addiction. And uh, we're gonna start the conversation now. Really excited to be here. Well, thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming. Uh, we really appreciate that IIS is giving us this, this platform to have this discussion. So um, you've been specializing in drug use and in the op opioid epidemic in the United States. Can you tell us what is the, what is the extent of, of the problem in the United States and, and why should this be a main priority in uh, the, and, and the epidemic plan? I mean, the opioid crisis is devastating. And in terms of numbers, for example, there's been in 2017, 72,000 people dying from overdoses. And no one, at the same time, there are other very negative consequences from the opioid. There have been a significant increase in people who are injecting drugs. And because we don't necessarily have all over the place syringe exchange programs, that has actually opened up the source for new infections. So the incidence of hepatitis has started to go up, climbing and climbing. We don't know exactly how the incidence of HIV has been accept, uh, um, affected by this increase in injection practices. There are evidence, of course, of the outbreak that happened in Scott County, Indiana. But, but also there are multiple states and counties that are reporting similar outbreaks. And in general, those are outbreaks in places that don't have syringe exchange programs or do not offer treatment for, for opioid addiction because you need both of these aspects to combat it. So as the opioid crisis has continued to grow and grow unabated, it has become clear that we need to change such that we can provide medications for those addicted and also start to recognize the importance of screening and treating infectious diseases occurring in them. So it sounds like two areas where there, there may be some gaps and we may need to really address in, in, in the U.S. is as uh, safe injection sites and then also treating the, the, uh, the opioid addiction. So medications to treat the opioid addiction, not just HIV medications. Is that, is that right? Well, the way that I would phrase it, because it's actually even simpler, uh, you just need places where you can get easy access of clean syringes where yep. you are not stigmatized. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself will basically control the infectivity. By a, that's one of the sides. The other side is the treatment of people that are addicted. And the other side, of course, is the treatment of those that are addicted that are, have HIV. Because you need to actually deal viral suppression to stop any infectivity. You need to keep them on medication for their opioid addiction so that they are compliant with their antiretroviral therapy. And you need to give them access to uh, clean syringes so that there is no the transmission of, say, hepatitis C. So there are those three components that we need to address, and we need to actually expand. In the United States, we need to expand the, the infrastructure to be able to do that. So the, the um, issues of, of, of sharing needles and of um, opioid addiction and of, you know, of, of transmission through, through needle sharing is, is, is prevalent around, around the world. What places are you seeing that are sort of good examples of a, of a, res of a response? Well, I think that the, perhaps the place that immediately jumps in my brain because of how visionary they were and how they came up with new models of care was Vancouver. And Vancouver was particularly problematic because not only were they injecting heroin, they were also injecting cocaine. And when you inject cocaine, it's even higher risk because you have to be injecting every 30 minutes as opposed to three or every hours. So the infectivity rate is even higher. And what they did was to come up with a non-judgmental, non-penalizing model of care where people could go and inject in a very safe environment and where they could have access to needles. And at the same time, in the same place, they provided them with access to treatment for their addiction on the mm -hmm. one hand. And also importantly, immediately, they were the first ones to basically uh, propose the use of antiretroviral therapy immediately, regardless of what your CD4 count was. So they show that by aggressively implementing these practices, they were able to, sh to see a decrease in the incidence of HIV among the whole population of Vancouver, but also among injection drug users. And that was way before anyone else. Yes, yes, yeah, Vancouver is such a, a pioneering city and with pioneering researchers and, and doctors. I, I, uh, I, th I think this kind of intersects with, with the work that I do with, with U equals U. And I have a question for you there. Um, 
we know that U equals U applies to sexual transmissions from you know, overwhelming body of evidence and recent studies. We know that in breastfeeding there have been transmissions uh, when the uh, mother was, also, was virally suppressed through breastfeeding. Uh, there's a big question mark around sh sharing needles, and I know that there's some research recently. Would you say that U equals U applies to transmission through needle sharing? Well, based on the study that uh, published by the group of uh, Julio Montaner and collaborators, where they actually do show the relationship between implementing treatment right away and containing the epidemic, that they're in fact, I mean, it is through their work on injection drug users that they basically say treatment or with the antiretroviral uh, treatment for HIV as a prevention to for infection of HIV. So he was the first one to coin it like that yeah. as it relates to injection drug use. And that data is actually quite convincing. It's very, very solid. Then it came in other, other factors uh, like discordant couples replicated similar findings with a, perhaps um, a more randomized, with a randomized clinical trial design. But I would say that the data, certainly the evidence is very strong that definitively antiretroviral treatment, viral suppression, when you don't detect it, there is no evidence that you will be infecting someone else. Having said that, one of the aspects too that we need to convey is that you may, not, you may be completely virally suppressed, and so if you are going to be sharing your needle with someone else, perhaps you are not going to be contaminating them with HIV. But it's, HIV is not the only thing that you infect someone with contaminated material. And so you will be contaminating them very likely because of the high prevalence with hepatitis C. And so, so when we send a message, the message is yes, uh, antiretroviral therapy will basically prevent you from infecting others for HIV. For HIV. But you have to actually use behavior of good practices as handling syringe that is clean. Yep. and that should be accessible to you to actually prevent you from getting other infections. And it's not the only one, hepatitis C. We're seeing a right. lot of endocarditis. There are multiple infections, the rate of which has gone out because of these injections with, with dirty needles. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So still to educate people about uh, transmission through needle sharing of HIV, but there's still other infections that people can get and other reasons why they should have uh, uh, clean needles, access to clean ne needles. Um, one, one last question I have. Uh, so when we, we started the U equals U campaign, really for the first year or two, we would hear from people, oh, this, this doesn't apply to people who inject drugs. And uh, if you tell people this, uh, who are injecting drugs, they're going to be confused and uh, they're not going to understand, so we don't tell people who inject drugs. What would you tell, what would you say to HIV information providers, whether it's clinicians or HIV organizations who are saying, don't tell U equals U to people who inject drugs? I mean, I think that is, that's uh, terribly discriminatory. It's stigmatizing of the person that is injecting drugs. And I hear it all the time, and it has been very frustrating, for example, to see clinical trials where people that inject drugs are not included. And that is, in part, reflects the stigma of treating them differently. I mean, there is not, there's not a reason to treat them differently. In fact, providing them with antiretroviral therapy will lead them to much better outcomes for themselves, but also for others. So the message should be like the one that we convey to anyone else that has HIV, provide them with antiretroviral therapy, while at the same time, educate them about safe practices. You know, also, that, that same applies to actually with sexual relationships. You may have viral suppression completely, and so you're not going to be infecting with HIV, but you will be infecting with syphilis and other uh, sexually transmitted diseases if you do not exert uh, behaviors that are cautionary. The, the infection, there, are, there are many other infections. So I think that we need to send both of those messages I agree, I agree, and I think it's important for people to know, what we always say to people too, is that um, when you treat people who inject drugs with dignity, as Bill, Bill Cook says from Scott County, Indiana, where there's the largest outbreak, if you treat people with, with dignity and you, you educate and empower them, they do very well. In fact, you know, in, in, in Scott County, Indiana, the, the uh, viral suppression rates are very high. They're higher than the national average, you know, um, among people who inject are injecting drugs, the rates are very high. And so we just need to treat them with, with, with dignity and respect and, and give them 
information you know, about their bodies. I agree completely. Yeah. I mean, we need to change that stigmatization of the person that injecting drugs exactly. as, no, they are different. And, and, and in fact, I'm not surprised with the data of Scott County. I didn't realize that they were doing better than the general population. I do know that because we funded several researchers consistently showing that when you provide them with treatment of their addiction and of the antiretroviral, the, the, the outcomes are equivalent to those that don't inject drugs. Absolutely, they're, they're doing, it's, it's, it's really important to, to know that, to fight the stigma, you know, to show that you know, people who inject drugs are doing very well and taking care of their health and, and others if you empower them and you treat them with dignity. Thinking about the whole concept that you say, we treat them with dignity and I think that a component that makes it very difficult when you become addicted to drugs is you actually, uh, you yourself, stigmatize your own self and your own self-security is very low. So you isolate and withdraw. And, and that someone treats you with kindness and with respect in and of itself can do wonders for in, uh, helping you be successful on your treatment. So to the extent that we reject people that are addicted, that we are stigmatized, them, we actually are putting them in a much worse trajectory. Yeah. So I think that, that there's, I always been fighting with the concept of our, why is it that we cannot generate empathy for a person that's addicted? Why is it so difficult? And so we need to change that mentality and recognize that addiction is a devastating disease. And if you have addiction and you have many other medical diseases, be it HIV or hepatitis C or depression, you need to address the needs of that person. Absolutely. On the campaign, I, yeah. I mean, I think it's wonderful. I'm very, I mean, it's, a, a, I think, a brilliant concept and idea because one of the big challenges when you have data, how do you change the culture? And that's not automatic. And yet by consistently and in a very simple message, transmitting why you have to do it, it has changed practice much faster than I would have predicted, in fact. And yeah, it's wonderful. Move, um, move I think that some of the, 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 the key points are, you know, that, um, that in order to address the op opioid epidemic, we need accessible and safe places for people to, to exchange needles. And, um, and also we need to be, which is new to me, be, um, to be treating the medication for the opioid uh, uh, addiction, to the, yeah. for the drug addiction, not just HIV. And that with U equals U, it sounds like you're saying it, you know, theoretically does apply to needle sharing, but we need to keep in mind that when we, we talk about U equals U, that that's about HIV transmission and that there, people still uh, need to be aware there are other infections that could be transmitted by needle sharing. So the only thing that I would say is I would not say theoretically, I would say it does apply. Wait, wait, it oh, we need to quote apply. you. Really? Yes, it okay. Does apply. Can you say a quote right now on camera about how U equals <laughs> U applies? I am very happy to say. Okay, so. Can, uh, uh, all right. U equals U applies to injection drug use just like it applies for anything else. We need to treat. Fantastic, thank you for saying that. That will be on our next presentation slide uh, starting in the next couple of days. That's, that's, that's huge to hear that from you, who's uh, uh, clearly such an important expert in, um, you know, on uh, tr you know, needle sharing and on uh, drug use. So yeah, I no, I'm not saying it, it actually is stigmatizing. Again, it's like the same sort of thing. This does not apply. I mean, we need to actually stop that. Yeah, fantastic. Well. Well, thank you so much. This no, was a really welcome. important moment. I'm glad you're doing all of these, all you doing this. Thank you, and I'm glad you're doing your work too. I learned a lot. Likewise.